Good morning and welcome to Hope Church Online. My name is Jen and you are so welcome. Do comment in, get in touch with us and please do feel at home and feel part of what is going on this morning. As we meet together, let's take the opportunity to thank Jesus for the transforming work he does in people's lives. Jesus can change completely any situation or any person completely around. He can do amazing transformations. It says in 2 Corinthians, a letter in the New Testament, chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away and behold, all things are made new. We may have experienced already the transforming power of Jesus in our lives. If so, let's stay close to God and see what else he is going to do in our messy, complicated lives and the lives of those around us. In another New Testament letter, um, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians and again chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, never stop praying, never stop speaking to God. This week, we are starting as Hope Church in Community Groups, a prayer course. Um, do join in if you're not already booked on, get in touch and book on, that, that's a plug there. It's so important that we, we stay close to God as we journey with him. And in Proverbs chapter three and verse six in the Old Testament, it says, listen to God everywhere you go and in everything you do. He is who will keep you on the straight track, the right track, the, the perfect way to live your life. So as we meet together, let's just thank, thank you God again for the transforming power in our lives. Let's ask for more of, more of his Holy Spirit and let's see him do the miraculous in our mundane lives. Thank you, Father God, for the transforming power you have in our lives and other lives, other people we know, other people and situations around us. Thank you that we have witnessed that and will continue to do so. We pray that we'd stay really close to you so that we can be um, just ready for all that you are going to do um, with us and around us and through us. Let's worship. Blessed be your name. Land that is plentiful, the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. When found in the desert place, the walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. Darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name, when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all
set the glorious15 to 19 and pray together. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. Lord, thank you so much that 
we at Hope Church are a family, that we are part of your family. Um, thank you that you give us your spirit and you equip us and give us wisdom and knowledge of you. Um, supernatural knowledge and understanding of who you are. And God, I ask today that you would bring that supernatural spiritual wisdom to each and every one of us at Hope Church. I thank you that you give us a glorious inheritance, that we are your children. And I pray that we would know that. I pray that we would walk in that knowledge every day and that we would know the life that you have called us to, a life of joy and peace um, and the wonderful riches that you have given us. And Lord, I pray that we would understand and see more of your power in our everyday lives, that we would walk in that, that we would claim that because the name of Jesus has power, the power that raised you from the dead. I pray, Lord, that each and every one of us who believe in you at Hope Church this week would walk in wisdom and in power that you give us. Thank you that you are good, that you love us, and that we are all a part of your family. Amen. Just a really quick Hope Church update. The main thing going on in the life of Hope Church is the prayer course. This week, we beginning the 19th of April, we launched the prayer course, which will be running across all the different community groups that happen midweek. We're really excited about the prayer course. It's a great eight week course full of fantastic teaching, discussion and practical ways of how you can pray. We'll be looking at spiritual warfare, unanswered prayer, the, the, the nuts and bolts of how you go about praying. I really can commend it to you wholeheartedly. So if you're part of a community group, do prioritise it and do engage this week as we start week one. If you're not part of a community group and you're watching this, we would love you to connect. Wherever you're watching, you can connect. We'll be doing it via Zoom. So do email in admin at hopechurch newham Com. And I really think it fits really well. At the beginning of the year, we did the Bible course. Now we're doing the prayer course and the two really fit well together. Uh, as part of the, the Christian walk, it's great to study God's word and it's great to learn to pray and engage with our Father in heaven. So I'm excited about the prayer course that starts this week. Do let's continue uh, to meet with one another as we look towards um, Hope Church meeting in person towards the end of May. Let's continue to meet one another where possible, out for a walk, out in the park, wherever we can. Let's engage and meet with one another. I'm excited by what is to come. I'm excited by the prayer course. I'm excited by what God is doing amongst us. So Hope Church, let's keep strong and let's keep committed to Jesus and we're excited about the season ahead. Well, good morning, Hope Church. Uh, welcome to Hope Church Online, wherever you may be watching in different parts of London and across the world. Now, let me ask you a question. What was your favourite book growing up? For me, I loved uh, The Famous Five and The Secret Seven. I read all of them. And then in my teenage years, I read all the Agatha Christie novels. I used to love reading detective novels, Sherlock Holmes. So just pop in the chat. What was your favourite story growing up 
as a child. And then maybe as well, let's get some real chat going uh, today. What is your favourite film? What's the favourite film that you would just love to watch time and time again? I know for me, I used to love the film Gladiator, the one with Russell Crowe. Uh, watched it so many times. Actually, haven't watched it for a long time, but, but love that film. So I wonder what's your favourite story, your favourite film? You see, the truth is we all love a good story. And Jesus was the master of telling stories. We're going to begin a, a short preaching series today entitled Challenging Stories. Looking at some of the parables, the stories that Jesus told. Now, a parable is very succinctly an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And we're going to begin our series by looking at probably the best known parable in the Western world. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's the best known, but probably the most misunderstood. So it's so important that we set the context for Jesus telling this story, the reason that Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. So we're going to turn to Luke chapter 10, we're going to read verses 25 to 29, and we're going to look at the context, the reason that Jesus told this famous story. So let's read verse 25, starting there. And behold, a lawyer stood up stood up in front of Jesus to put into the test, saying, Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus was teaching, this lawyer interrupts with this question, what should I do to inherit eternal life? It was a question that was asked a lot at that time. I find it fascinating that that, that question was about heaven, it was about eternity. And yet so often, so few of us ask questions about eternity. But here, the, the scribes, the, the lawyers, the teachers of the law, the people of the day in Scripture were asking about things of eternal value, things of eternity, things of heaven. Now, Jesus then asked with a question. He answers his, the question with a question. Verse 26, he says, what is written in the law? How do you read it? It's actually a really helpful thing to do sometimes when people ask you a question about your faith or about Jesus. Sometimes you want to respond with a question because you want to find out what their real motive is, what they're really asking. They're just trying to trick you or are they sincere. And, and Jesus responds with a question. And then the lawyer quotes scripture, verse 27. The lawyer responds, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. In other words, what must you do to inherit eternal life? The lawyer is saying, love God and love one another. Verse 28, Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. In other words, Jesus is saying, live every day like this. Live every day, live loving God and loving one another. And you'll live. You'll go to heaven. You'll get a place in eternity. Now, if we're honest, we know we cannot do that. If we're honest, we know there are some days when, yes, we love God. Yes, we love him with all our heart, soul, mind. But there are other days when we struggle, when we don't involve God in our day, when we ignore him, when he's not part of any minute of our day. If we're honest, we know that there's some days that we love people around us really well. We love our family, we love our neighbours, we love our work colleagues, we're kind, we're compassionate, we're generous. But there's other days when we just, we're just selfish. We don't care about others' needs, we don't care about others' preference, it's all about number one. And even on the good days, even on the good days when we're loving God and loving others, we don't do it every second of every day. We have our moments, we have our dark hour or our bad 10 minutes. So if we're honest, can we live like this every day? The answer is no. But the lawyer, you see the lawyer, he thinks that he's okay. Verse 29, but desiring to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbour? Who is my neighbour? 
He's basically saying, look, Jesus, I think I've got this. I think I can do this. I think I can love God. I I think I can love other people, but just help me here. Who are you talking about? Who are you talking about, Jesus, that I need to love to have my place in heaven, to have my ticket booked? And it's into this context that Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And again, on the surface, I'm sure you've heard it many times. You think, oh, the Good Samaritan, helping people, caring for people, looking out for those who are on the side of the road, being kind. But the reality is it's far more profound than that. Because reality is the response to this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So let's look at the story of the Good Samaritan, starting Luke 10 again, but starting in verse 30, following on directly from this exchange between the lawyer and Jesus. Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell amongst robbers who stripped him, who beat him, and then departed, leaving him half dead. Now, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a road that you went down. You went down rocky enclaves. It was a 4,000 foot drop from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was a very dangerous road. Robbers and highwaymen used to hide in the rocks. It was very narrow in places. It was easy for people to be jumped upon, set upon, robbed. You know, it was very easy and rife with that kind of thing. So people knew this was a notorious journey dangerous place to be. And this man was attacked and stripped and left for dead. Could have been a long time before anyone came and found him there. Let's read on what happens, verse 31. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. The priest saw the man, but passed by. Maybe he was coming back from his two weeks up at the temple, serving in the house of God. Maybe he thought the man was dead and he thought if he touched him, he'd have to go back to the temple to purify himself in accordance with Jewish law. And he wouldn't be able to go home to see his family. We don't know. Verse 32. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw the man, passed by on the other side. Now, a Levite, it was in his job description to know the law and to serve God. That's what the Levites, the tribe of the Levites did. He knew that you were to help those who were in need. And yet he walks by on the other side. He ignores and he walks by. So verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where the man was. And when he saw him, He had compassion on him. Now, you have to understand, I'm sure many of you know, but the history is that the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. There was a profound animosity and hatred that went back centuries. If you want to think about it in today's context, the best I can do is this. Imagine that it's a Christian lying on the ground and and a member of Al-Qaeda, an IS member, comes walking past. Or it's a black man lying there in the road. And then walking past comes a a carrying, card-carrying Ku Klux Klan member who walks past and sees this black man lying in the road. We're told that the Samaritan saw him and took pity on him. And he goes to the man. And then what happens? Verse 34. He bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own horse and brought him to an inn and took care of him. You see, the Samaritan comes to the man and then practically demonstrates love and care and sacrifice. He bandages the wounds, almost certainly with his own clothes. He rips his own clothes and bandages 
the man's wounds. He uses oil to lubricate and soften the tissue and wine to sanitize and clean it. They were things that people often had in their bags, oil for cooking and oil for, for general use and wine to drink. And they were things that people would have carried on a journey. And so the man is ripping his clothes and pouring out his oil and pouring out his wine. He's practically loving and caring for this enemy of his who is half dead and lying on the floor. It's a picture of generosity and a picture of love. But it doesn't stop there because the man puts the, the wounded man onto his horse, his donkey, whatever it was, and takes him to the inn. This wouldn't have been a lavish five-star hotel, but it would have been a place where travellers were cared for and travellers would eat and drink as they went along their way. And we're told, verse 35, the next day, which means he would have stayed over, he would have stayed over there. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now, two denarii is roughly kind of the amount of money to, to look after that man for a month. It would have paid his board, his lodgings, his care for about a month. So again, we have this picture of generosity, of love and care. Verse 36 and verse 37, after the story has been told, then Jesus says, which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Like I've said, we have in the Good Samaritan a picture of generosity of love in action that crosses racial, cultural boundaries, status boundaries. It's limitless love in action. But remember, remember the context. Remember the reason that Jesus told this story. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus tells a story. There once was a man. Jesus is saying, if you want to earn your way into the kingdom of God, if you want to earn your way to heaven, then this is what love looks like. This is what loving your neighbour looks like. Do I qualify? Do you qualify? No. The lawyer who asked the question, did he qualify? No. You can't. You don't and you never will be able to love like this day in and day out. You see, Jesus was driving home a point to the lawyer, his inability to deserve his place in heaven. And Jesus wants us all to say, I can't do it. I can't do it. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, I grew up, I heard this story countless times in Sunday school. I'm sure many of you would have heard it. Growing up, it's even in most, it's in culture, the whole term, a good Samaritan. You know, people in news stories, and oh, that person was a good Samaritan. They looked after and cared for that person in need. I grew up thinking, well, it's all about helping people. It's all about caring people. It's all about how we should act towards others. But you know what? The reality is this. We're not the Good Samaritan, although we're called to be like him. In this story, we're not the Good Samaritan. You and I are the wounded man. We're bleeding. We're beaten. We're wounded by life, by life's bruises, by life's injuries. And religion won't help you. The Levite, the priest, religion won't help you. You need to be rescued. You need a saviour, and his name is Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth. Jesus Christ got his hands dirty, and Jesus Christ died on the cross in our place to be our rescuer. 
Jesus is the good Samaritan. Jesus is the ultimate good Samaritan. We are the wounded man and Jesus is the good Samaritan. I find it interesting, fascinating, that verse 25, when, uh, when, when the lawyer asked the question, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, when you inherit something, whether it be money or a house or whatever it is, you inherit something and you've done nothing. Either someone has died or someone has given you some money or whatever it is. But when you inherit it, you get it through nothing that you have done. That's salvation through Jesus Christ. We inherit eternal life through what Jesus has done on the cross. Jesus is our gift of a saviour and a rescuer. Now, I just want to take a few more minutes to focus on the priest and the Levite, because I think there's a real challenge here for all of us. Because what made a priest and a Levite walk by on the other side? Why didn't they care? Why didn't they help? Because I think this is incredibly challenging for you and I, because really this is Christians in the story, the priest and the Levite, religious people, that's us. But why did they walk by on the other side? Why is it that we often have a tendency to walk by on the other side? So let's look briefly at this. Why did the priest and the Levi walk by on the other side? I think there's three reasons. Firstly, they felt superior. You see, the priest had just been serving God in the temple, doing his duties. He'd been close to God. He had a high and exalted position. The Levi also served in the temple, so the Levites did. Their tribe, their whole life was devoted to serving God. Their whole identity, their whole reason to live was to serve God. Both the priest and the Levite had a high view of themselves. But in reality, the priest and the Levite were ordinary men, ordinary people like you and I. They would have had a past, they would have had failures, they would have had pains, they would have had mistakes that they would have made. They were ordinary people. But because of their position, because of their role in life, they felt superior. They acted superior to the beaten up man that they saw on the road to Jericho. So they passed by on the other side. Church, we must be very careful. We do not act like this ourselves. Oh, I'm better than dot, 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 dot. So I not get involved. Oh, it's really their own fault. Because I'm a Christian and I don't do those things. So I'm not going to get involved. Oh, as a person in my position... I can't be seen to go there to help that person or to to be involved in their issues. Romans 12, 3 says, We are not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. And yet the truth is we do. All the time we do. We think of ourselves in a position of superiority from others. And there are certain places and certain people and certain situations that we label, not for me. No, that area, those people, not for me, not for me, not for me, not for me, thank you. So whenever an issue comes up, I walk by on the other side. It's a sad fact that the two men, the priest and the Levite, had been close to God and yet did not act with God's love. And for some of us, this is an uncomfortable but truth that we need to hear. Because our coping mechanism, when we see the pain, when we see the hardship, when we see the difficulties in this world, is, oh, it's not my problem. Oh, they're below me. Oh, they don't deserve my help. That's our coping mechanism. We don't like to say it, we don't like to articulate it, but our coping mechanism is that we are superior to them. 
The second reason I think that they walked by on the other side is that they pretended to ignore. We're told, verse 31, that the priest saw the man. The Levite, verse 32, saw the man. It was a narrow road from Jerusalem to Jericho. They saw the wounded man, and yet they moved on. They ignored the need. I think there's much in life that we pretend not to see. Oh, we see it, all right, but we pretend not to see it. We tell ourselves we haven't seen it. We ignore it. We push it out. And I'm not just talking about the homeless man on the street. I'm talking about the work colleague who is crying and struggling. But we ignore it because we know it will be too messy. Or the neighbour's children who are unsupervised and no one's looking after them. We ignore it because we don't want to get involved. The person at church who is lonely, who's got no one else, who no one's speaking to, who no one's called, who no one's messaged. Oh, we just ignore it because we know if we do, we'll get countless talk messages and countless phone calls. And we just don't want to be inconvenienced by that. Or it's the friend who we know has a difficult life and we know that getting involved will mean 101 things. So we just ignore it and push it away. You see, we see so much, but our coping mechanism in the pain of this world and the pain of what we see is to ignore, pretend we do not see. Um, If I'm honest, I know I do that a lot. I know the majority of us do that. It's a coping mechanism, but we've got to be real and honest that that's what we do. We act superior. We we pretend that we don't see things. We ignore the harsh realities of this world. And I think the third thing we do, which the priest and the Levite would have done, we give excuses. We give excuses. You see, the priest and the Levite, they had excuses for ignoring the bleeding man, the wounded man. And you will always have an excuse. You'll probably always have at least one or two good excuses. Why not to help someone and get involved? The priest and the Levite would have been in a hurry to get home. The priest would have been serving in the temple for weeks and wanted to get home to see his family. You know, if the sun set, if it had taken a long time, then the robbers would have come back and maybe he would have got attacked as well. He'd have been worried, I already mentioned it, about being defiled if the man was dead and having to go back to the temple and, oh, I don't want to get involved in that way because it will mean a defilement and it will mean all this extra thing that I have to do. Or maybe the excuse was simply, I don't like blood. I can't deal with it. I can't deal with it. My stomach turns. Maybe the excuse was, well, we'll just pray and walk by. We'll just pray and walk by on the other side. There will always be excuses for not helping people. Always. I've got no time. My time is stretched. I've got a meeting. I've got so many other things. I've got no time for this. What if it goes wrong and it looks bad? What if it goes wrong and and something comes back to hit me? I don't have any expertise in that area. I can't help someone with their drug problem. I can't help someone with their money problem. I've got no expertise in that area. There's always an excuse. Oh, it'll be ongoing. It will never end. Once I start getting involved with that person, then it carries on and on and on and on and on and on. And it never, ever ends. I help tomorrow when I'm prepared, when I'm ready. When I've got more time. We always have an excuse. Jesus says, go and do likewise. In other words, go and be like me, Jesus says. Jesus, the good Samaritan, says, go and be like me. Go and be good Samaritans in reflection of Jesus, the perfect good Samaritan. But the harsh truth is, We're more like the priest and the Levite than we would like to admit. Our coping mechanism kicks in. I'm superior. I've got an excuse. I just want to ignore. But let's take a moment before we finish to look at Jesus again. Because Jesus is our good Samaritan. And what does he do? Jesus takes on compassion towards you and I. 
verse 33 says that the Good Samaritan took pity on the man. Or some translations say was deeply moved by what he saw. We know that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. We know that Jesus had great compassion on the crowds and on individuals. A great and a deep compassion is what Jesus had for humanity, for the suffering, for the trials of this life, for the impact of sin. Jesus has a compassion for you and I. But it doesn't just stop with a compassion. It doesn't just stop by being, being moved. It moves to action. So yes, the, the good Samaritan took pity, but then he went to him. He went to the man. He crossed over and went and helped this bleeding man who was in pain, in agony, half dead on the side of the road. It was compassion in action. Compassion that walked over to the other side of the road. Jesus showed compassion in action by leaving heaven and coming to earth. John 6, 38, Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of the one who sent me. The will of God was to save mankind. The compassion of Jesus didn't stop there. It led to action. It led to coming down to earth. And then it led to sacrifice. Verse 34, we, we looked at it. The man bandages him up. Oil and wine. Time and money. A picture of sacrifice. A picture of generosity. But Jesus, our good Samaritan, gave himself to die on the cross in our place. His blood was poured out for once and for all sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. The ultimate sacrifice, the price paid. Jesus is our perfect good Samaritan who sacrificed everything to die on the cross in our place. To bring healing to our lives, to bring a life in all its fullness. Jesus, the Good Samaritan, demonstrated compassion and action and sacrifice. So let me conclude with a challenge. Two questions. Firstly, have you accepted the help of the Good Samaritan? Jesus offers you his hand. It's the wounded hand of the Saviour. Jesus loves you. And he acted by coming to earth and dying on a cross and three days later rising again. Listen, there's no other way to eternal life. You cannot earn your way to eternal life. We all need to accept the help of our rescuer, of our wounded saviour, of the good Samaritan, Jesus Christ. The second question, which shoes will you put on today? We all wear shoes, don't we? When we go out the door, we all put on shoes. I want you to think as you go into this week, what shoes are you gonna put on? Are you gonna put on the shoes of the Levite or the priest? The shoes that say I'm superior, I just ignore the pain that I see around me and I make excuses. And there's always a good excuse, but I will make an excuse not to get involved and not to be a good Samaritan to those around me. Will you put on the shoes of the priest and the Levite? Or will you put on the shoes of a good Samaritan and demonstrate compassion to those you come into contact with? to act with love and to act with sacrifice. However God leads you to be generous, to be sacrificial, to cross boundaries of race, to cross boundaries of status, to cross any boundary, but to demonstrate the love, the sacrifice and the kindness of God. It's a daily choice to love your neighbour. 
We all wear shoes. Which shoes will you wear? The shoes of the priest, the shoes, shoes of the Levite, or the shoes of a good Samaritan? Let me pray. Father God, we thank you that you, Lord Jesus, are the perfect good Samaritan. Lord, we are wounded. We've been hurt. We've been wounded by this life. But thank you that we can put our faith and our trust in you, Lord Jesus. And you will come and bandage us up and, and, and heal our wounds and heal our pains and take us to be recuperated and to, and to flourish and to go again. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the perfect good Samaritan. And help each one of us this week to live lives that reflect yours, to live loving our neighbours, to not have excuse after excuse, to not ignore the issues, the problems, the pains of this world, but to love people with compassion and to act and to sacrifice as God you lead. The world we are in is hurting. The world we are in is in pain. It needs us to reflect you, Jesus, and to love those around us. Amen. Praise what have you done? Better for me on that cross. Of the sin washed away in your blood, so much to make sense of it all. I know that your love breaks my heart. The scandal of grace, you died in my place, so my soul will live all to be alive. Just to know you, Jesus, there's no one besides you, forever the hope in my heart. Whatever is your sting, power. There's no one beside you, forever the hope in my heart. Oh, to be like you, give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever the hope in
Jesus, there's no one beside you. Forever the hope in my life. The hope in my life. Forever the hope. Forever the hope in my life.